Hello and welcome to week 5, part 3 of EGM 703, Application of GPR to Glaciology. In this lesson, we'll discuss some of the different ways that GPR has been used to study glaciers and ice sheets. One of the biggest applications of, of GPR in glaciology has been to measure ice thickness. Ice thickness is a critical measurement for estimating gla current glacier volumes in order to understand current water resources. It's also necessary for glacier and ice sheet modeling in order to be able to project changes into the future. One small issue that we run into as glaciologists is that ice is very, very heavy. So we can't just go up to the glacier, lift it up in order to measure how thick it is. On a more serious note, another way to measure ice thickness is by drilling a hole through the ice and measuring the depth. This is a very time and energy intensive process and it only provides us with a single point measurement. So it's not a very efficient way to measure thicknesses on large spatial scales. The use of GPR in glaciology dates back to the pre-1930s, and a lot of glaciology studies, especially those earlier studies, call the technique radio echo sounding, because in effect what we're doing is we're sending out radio waves and then using, using the echoes to sound the depth, or measure the depth, uh, though more recently terms like ice penetrating radar or even ground penetrating radar have become more prevalent. There are a range of frequencies that we use in glacier GPR studies, depending on the particular application. For measuring ice thicknesses on very thick ice sheets, we typically use lower frequencies below a few hundred megahertz or so. Higher frequency radars above a few hundred megahertz or so are often used for more shallow applications like measuring the depths of snow layers. In addition to ice thickness and bed topography, GPR has also been used to study internal layers within the glacier or ice sheet, crevasses at the surface or the base of the glacier, drainage structures, including the presence of entire lakes underneath the ice sheets, and plenty of other things. These studies aren't limited to glaciers and ice sheets on Earth either. There are currently two radar sounders in orbit around Mars that have been used to map surface ice deposits, like the example shown here of the Gemenalingula region of Mars taken from the shallow radar sounder, or SHARAD, on board NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. The temperature of ice within a glacier can vary significantly, both seasonally due to changes in air temperature and the presence of meltwater, but also with depth. At different pressures, for example, due to the weight of overlying ice, the melting temperature of ice drops. At a depth of one kilometer, ice will melt at about minus 0.7 degrees C rather than zero degrees C. So we can classify ice or even glaciers based on the ice temperature relative to the pressure melting temperature. Cold ice or cold based glaciers are glaciers where the temperature is below the pressure melting temperature everywhere. We can see an example of a radar gram of a cold base glacier, Telbrean on Svalbard, here. In this figure, purple colors indicate higher reflectance. Within the glacier, we see almost no reflectance, owing in part to the lack of liquid water within the ice. Temperate glaciers are glaciers where the temperature is at, or very near, the pressure melting temperature, except near the glacier surface in winter. And finally, we can have a mix of cold and temperate ice, which is known as a polythermal glacier. So here, we see how below a certain depth, there is a comparatively strong reflectance all throughout the glacier, and this is indicative of the presence of liquid water, meaning that the ice is temperate. The red line in the radar gram for Kongsve and Herr indicates the location of the cold temperate transition surface or CTS. Where this is and whether the cold ice is on the top or the bottom tells us something about the bed conditions. Where glaciers have cold ice at the bottom or bed of the glacier, we know that they can't be sliding. And in this case, we say that they're frozen to the bed. The presence of liquid water at the bed of the glacier has an impact on how the glacier flows. In general, when there's water at the bed, the glacier is able to slide, which increases how fast the glacier flows. 
As ice melts, meltwater starts flowing, which creates a drainage network on top of the glacier, inside or through the glacier, and also under the glacier. Mapping the routes of surface water is easy enough, but with GPR, we can also map end glacial and subglacial tunnels. They create reflections that show up in the radar. This 2021 study shows a great example of what this looks like. With a gridded GPR survey, they mapped the drainage network, estimated how big the tunnels are, which can tell us something about how much water is moving or routed through the tunnels. This also tells us something about how the glacier slides over its bed. One limitation here is that as the amount of meltwater changes, the size of the drainage tunnels changes. As more meltwater is routed through these tunnels, they tend to grow. As soon as the melt stops and the water drains out, the tunnels start to close due to the weight of the ice. But they still provide us a very useful snapshot, and for some glaciers, melt tunnels even remain throughout the winter and into the following spring. With data sets that now span over 50 years, we've been able to map ice thicknesses and bed topography on the scale of entire continents, like the bed topography map shown here for Antarctica. We can see, for, for example, how most of West Antarctica, which is the left side of the image here, is actually underwater. And this has very important implications for how the ice sheet will change in the presence of an increasingly warming climate including the potential for very large rises in global sea level. In East Antarctica, the right side of the image here, we see that most of the ice sheet is grounded above sea level, though there are some areas where we do see deep trenches that reach into the interior of the ice sheet. And we can also see what the estimated ice thickness for Antarctica is, with ice nearly four kilometers thick in some areas. In order to generate these maps, we have to interpolate the relatively sparse survey lines. And to do this, we typically use a principle called mass conservation rather than methods that we've looked at before, like inverse distance weighting or kriging. And this helps us to ensure that the interpolated ice thickness conforms to the physical laws that govern ice flow. To do this interpolation, we're effectively modeling the flow of ice using the measured ice thicknesses and some, in, some observations of surface velocity and maybe some other parameters as well. We can also see here how the resolution of the interpolated ice thickness and to bed topography is limited by the spacing of the survey lines. In more heavily sampled areas like West Antarctica, we see quite a bit of detail. In the interior of East Antarctica, where surveys are more spaced out, we see how the estimated topography tends to be smoother and less detailed. To gather all of these measurements, we don't normally use ground-based GPR surveys, like the example shown here, with a GPR towed behind a snow machine or a snowmobile. This is because it's very difficult to map large-scale areas from the ground. For example, this transect of the Bering Glacier in Alaska is over 50 kilometers long from start to finish. Even with a snow machine, this would be a very difficult distance to cover in a single day. As we're trying to extend the scale to mountain ranges, this is even more true, especially because these can be extremely dangerous areas to cross. So one solution is to use airborne instruments that are normally carried by a helicopter. These measurements of glaciers in Alaska, taken from a 2013 paper by Rigneault and others, were acquired by one such airborne instrument. And a great many of the measurements that went into the bed topography map of Antarctica on the previous slide were also acquired using airborne instrumentation. At the other end of the depth scale, GPR can also be used to measure snow depths, typically using higher frequencies than what we see for very thick ice. One of the things that we can see with GPR is the presence of melt layers within the snowpack. The line here in the middle of the radar cram indicates the transition from snow to fern, which is snow that has survived through a summer melt season and into the next winter. Because the fern surface has typically melted and refrozen, it usually has a noticeable crust on the surface that shows up in the radar image. With measurements of snow density, we can also use GPR-derived snow depths to estimate the total amount of water contained within the snowpack. This is the snow water equivalent. 
In addition to density measurements that are taken in different snow pits, we can also compare the GPR derived snow depths to the snow depths that we measure using snow probes. And these are basically long metal poles that we stick down into the snow. When the, po when the probe hits the crust, you can actually feel that crust layer and we can measure the amount of the probe that is then within the snowpack and this gives us a way to confirm the reliability of the radar measurements. In this lesson, we've seen how GPR has a very long history in studying glaciers. It can be used for a number of different applications, including investigations of the temperature profile within the glacier, and glacial and subglacial drainage networks, ice thickness and volume, and even snow depths. The measurements that we make with GPR on glaciers provide key inputs for glacier and ice sheet models, which help us make predictions about the future changes of glaciers and ice sheets. As always, I've included the links to the different articles referenced in the presentation here. They're also available on the slide notes, and you can find PDF versions uh, either through these links for some of them or in the Zotero library. I've also added a few additional papers to the library that weren't covered here, so feel free to browse those as well. Uh, the first link here is a fantastic review paper from 2020 that uh, sort of lays out a whole history of the use of radio echo sounding or ice penetrating radar in glaciology. Uh, the second link here, this bedmap Himalayas link, is a short video by the British Antarctic Survey that um, in addition to providing amazing footage of airborne GPR surveys in action, it also provides some pretty phenomenal views. So. That's all for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me or post in the discussion forum on Blackboard. Bye!